I agree, and I, I'm not that I'm a panelist, but again, just from the outside, listening to this debate, I ask myself, uh, if I think about the energy sector, for example, depleting uh, fossil fuels, depletion of fossil fuels, there's a, we, we know we know we have to go to renewables, but the big debate is actually, you'll save a lot more if you're more efficient than if you just dig up a new type of fuel. So it's the same thing for water, and I think India has done a lot on this as well, and I know China has, in when you have small water tanks which are you know, in very bad state of repair. I think Sri Lanka has a phenomenal number, and if they repaired those rather than actually focused on big water storage projects, you would have a significant improvement in, in the fight against climate change. So I ask, is it the case that, because dams are almost simple, we've been doing them for thousands of years, we know how it works, there are very big vested interests, there are operators, there are governments, there's corruption, let's face it, that in a sense that promotes the argument for big types of storage when, and, and doing things like tank repair is more complicated, it's more difficult, it takes more time. Do you think that perhaps this plays into this argument and encourages big dam, big water storage development? You know, firstly, corruption is a man-made phenomenon. Mm -hmm. We need to address that in a completely different way. If you feel that by avoiding dams you can avoid corruption, I will be for it. I mean, we can then immediately decide dam with dams mm -hmm. and dam with corruption at the same time. If you can end the corruption of the world by stopping dam activity, I would be very happy. And if somebody believes in that, I would rather believe that, you know, we should construct one dam in his name, we should remain there forever, where the corruption has been drowned in that dam forever. <laughs> so first of all, corruption has nothing to do with something with big dams or other. People will find out, invent ways of being corrupt, and therefore corruption has to be dealt in a different way. So this is not something, let us not link one with the other. So that's first point. Secondly, whether we need small solution, I'm all for small solution. You know, but... If, then we need everything small. We should not have big population. If we have small population, like what we had thousand years ago, I think we never needed this solution. We never needed this panel. Because probably if so many people will not assemble. This could be the world population probably. So this we don't need a problem then. So we need small solution when we have everything small. We cannot have big population and small solution. So we really need to make sure that some of these solutions that we think about are fitting with something which we really have. That is second. The third point is, so there are some man-made problems. Like we have constructed wrong dams, we should never construct them. We have constructed something which is not compatible with nature, we should not do it. Now the question is whether we should have, so these are man-made issues. Corruption, wrong planning, this is man-made. The second part is the, the part dealing with how do you actually ensure that the nature mm, laws are taken into account. So that's something which has to be done in a proper manner. So I'm very sure that we really need solutions which cannot be dogmatic by saying we are opposed to this because something happened in 60s, 58, and we can chronicle those events. We really need to find out if that happened really, how to avoid that happening in future. We must make sure that how we can actually work in a manner that will fit with the realities of life. And something, please remember, countries, there are several countries in the world Who's, and for that matter, any country which has developed in the world has developed because of only two sources. One is a natural resource, other is a human resource. All capital, other thing, what we really talk about is fungible, that comes from any part of the world. So basically the countries can develop on natural as well as human resource. Now natural resource in most of the developing countries is water. And therefore if you cannot develop a developing strategy which is immune to this reality, we can never develop the country. Then this is a sustainable issue, this is an issue related to that. And therefore we really need to find out a solution which actually takes into consideration all these factors. Mm -hmm. And I hope we are really pragmatic, realistic, and also in terms of making sure that we take all these factors into consideration. Zachary, can I just ask, uh, because Minister Mutagamba will have to leave at 2.30, so uh, could I ask you to comment on that? Okay, thank you very much, Madam. And I really want to thank my colleague here for having put it straight and blank that no, we need this storage and it is not something that we have to debate about because the demands are there. And I wanted to, 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 to talk to Zachary. You know, you think that corruption can be pegged on to dams, but corruption can be pegged on even to other things like industries, like aeroplane manufacture and all of that. So let's not put dams and say that that's where corruption starts. Maybe that's where it ends. Secondly, you know, we are talking about dams, not only for hydropower, 
but we are talking about them for the res resilience to climate change. And that's what really, especially for us in Africa, that's what really matters. Because you can't believe that in one season, in 2007, I saw tons and tons of water flowing and washing away the soil and the people's property and bridges. And it all went. That was the month of September. I went back in March and I found women looking for water and eating leaves to get saliva, to get a liquid in their body. And yet you could have dammed that water and keep it and they would have sustained it. Another thing, you know, when this water comes and goes, because you get it in torrentials, it definitely destroys our environment. But when we keep it, it somehow improves on the environment around. It moderates on the temperatures in between. It brings back the natural habitat, the animal, the bird, the, the butterflies, and all that. So for us, we think that that is something. At the same time, in areas that are really arid, like Karamoja, I'm sure you have heard about Karamoja, that's where we can get even the people to settle. Because normally, traditionally, people settle where there is water. Now, in these areas, you can actually persuade people to settle and develop. Without that, people will continue meandering. And when you ask them, they say, we are looking for our water. And that water ended up in the Mediterranean. Definitely, they'll never get there. So we think it is a must. It is absolutely necessary for us to do something for them, keep them in one place, develop them, and moderate on the environment. And finally, as I go, I really want to, to thank the World Bank, because as we say, 10 years before, it was a bit difficult to talk about infrastructure development, especially in water and large dams. But now I can see the trend that we are able to talk and get listened to, and the projects are coming on board. And I think we are going to, to move much faster toward that. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Yeah, if I could just respond to a, a few points. I think that nobody is uh, disagreeing that uh, you want to give access to water for women in Africa, I think that's a tragedy that should be uh, fixed as soon as possible. I, I agree with you. I think that the question here is how uh, efficient and how flexible are large hydropower dam storage reservoirs? I would argue, and coming back to our colleague from India's point, that with more people, a decentralized approach in a smaller scale that is closer to where people actually are is much more effective than creating a large centralized infrastructure, in the case with water storage where you have to pump it across large distances, or you have to, uh, in the case of hydropower, create extensive, uh, very expensive grid transmission, for example. I think, it, I, I would argue it's more effective to give people the access to water where they are and in a centralized participatory way uh, that is at the same time cheaper and quicker to build. I can see this has got a lot you of people can, going. I'll take the I, first I, intervention from Martin. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the issue of why are we talking about storage? What is, what is the rationale for, for, for the storage, in fact? So we have a number of kind of services we expect from, from storage. We expect drinking water, we expect energy, hydro, hydroelectricity, we expect flood protection. And, and we, we also have uh, irrigation for the fields and industry. So the question is, for me, what are the kind of the opportunities we have out there in terms of energy, for example? Has a country done a proper assessment of kind of how they move towards a low carbon economy and what the different energy wedges are and what the investments are and the risks associated with regard to the different kind of energy sectors? I would say very few countries have done that, unfortunately. So I think that would come first for me. And isn't that a role for the World Bank to get involved in those sorts of things? I, I'm interrupting and I'll come back to you, but I think we should pick up on these while we're dealing with this. Yeah, and I, I, th I, think, I think absolutely it is. And you're seeing countries develop low emissions development plans. You're seeing countries think this through. They need help to do it. But frankly, they also face you know, a, a game of gotcha. You know, Every country is going to have to have an energy transition, and their energy transition is going to involve um, to get from where they are to where they want to be, exploitation of all forms of renewable energy. Some have some endowments, some don't. It's also going to require, you know, transition of continued use of fossil fuels until that until there's something else in place. And hydro is going to be part of the mix for some countries. Take Kenya for example. It can develop, um, you know, a large amount of geothermal because it's blessed with that, right? 
It's got some thermal that it's using. It's about to develop its wind, and they've got some off-grid small solar solutions until bigger solar, the price point comes down. But guess what? They're going to be importing cheap hydro from Ethiopia into a regional power pool because that will be the most efficient way for them to fill up the gap. Now, you know, if, 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 if hydro is bad, continued use of thermal is bad, and you need some kind of baseload power, and everybody thinks nuclear is bad, I mean, we got, we've, just, we've got to be sensible about what these energy transitions really mean for countries, and then development partners, national ones, as well as multilateral ones, have to be there to help with that transition. But you can't just keep knocking down every solution when it comes up and say, no, no, no. You've got to be able to help them through a transition. You know, Minister. when we talk about uh, energy, which is actually a byproduct of water, really speaking, because it's not a main purpose for which the water is made. So what is required for agriculture, what is it for food, what is it needed for drinking, what is needed for many other purposes. But that incidental. But the point I'm saying is, in context of climate change, what is the cause of climate change? Actually, it's a cause, basically, is burning of fossil fuels. So we really need to find out non-fossil fuel uses to meet energy demand of the world. And there, hydropower comes in. But I'm not saying the only hydropower. We really need distributed generation. And therefore, in fact, I was the one who authored a new law for the parliament, uh, for the country, in which we are talking about distributed generation in a big way. In fact, we already started talking about making about 600,000 villages. But try to understand that we really need some base load. We can, when we actually talk about energy, and we think that unless we have a storage of energy, which really comes as a breakthrough, we still need energy which can come from centralized sources. Just distributed generation can meet all the needs is a very good idea, but not something which has, I would rather request my friend to tell me which where part of the world where we have got all the energy meets or has been met from distributed generation. If you can tell me that, we'll be very happy. But we really need, therefore, a marriage of some grid energy, which can serve as a base load, and we still need a distributed generation, which can actually happen locally. We really need marriage of both. The second part on energy is that we really need energy security, which is the country's major concern. How do you address energy security? Some country which has a huge potential for water would rather address that through hydroelectricity, like Brazil is doing in a big way. There are countries where we don't have blessed with so much of water, would rather like do it. You gave example of Sri Lanka, which has a very good program of doing with the run of the water scheme, best, best program. But to believe that run of the water schemes are environmentally not damaging is probably a misconception. Because something like this, we have to look at it. So we really need, I'm coming back to the point, I'm not for dams or not something, but I'm just saying very clearly, we really need customized solutions. We really need to find out all these issues rolled into one, how do you find solution to that? And I will be very happy to be enlightened where the distributed generation, like in US, has it worked that we work on distributed generation? Or somewhere in Europe we are working on it? Or where we are working on it? Could you please enlighten me? I'll be very happy. Thank you. I think we've now got John and then Gabriel who would like to have a word. I'd like to... the. I've heard a lot this week about the green economy. And I think in the same way in which we are looking at uh, any type of infrastructure needs to be looked as, as does it, is it fit for service, is it sustainable, is it cost effective, the same test needs to be applied to many other things. We hear a lot on small is beautiful, local is good, distance is bad. I think there's a very interesting uh, empirical piece of work that's been emerged from the Australian experience in the last seven or eight years. Uh, specifically, if you look at Australia's cities, there was a very large investment in local water harvesting in their cities as an alternative to larger infrastructure. Uh, I would urge everybody to go and look at the National Water Commission report on Australia's urban future because this lays out a very clear message. And that is that, well, there are two messages. The first message is that a utility manager, which I think is, is pertinent to us here, has to start thinking about a risk management strategy. And you have to think of a portfolio of options to get the level of risk that your society is willing to get. But the second part that's very interesting is if you're a utility manager of an urban water utility almost anywhere, your marching orders from the minister have been provide a reliable service at the least possible cost. And utility managers, that's what they do. What they found in Australia was there was a lot of so-called green initiatives which were then 
added to the utilities portfolio and were invested in because there was political will for it. When they look back afterwards, these turned out to be by far the least cost effective of everything they did. And the report ends up by saying, do you want the utility manager to still manage at least cost or do you want him to manage a green city? And by the way, tell the people the bill will be three times the cost if it is that. So the assumption that close and small and local is somehow more environmentally, more cost effective, sometimes it may be, but it is an assumption that has to be looked at just as the assumptions on large infrastructure have to be looked at.